Welcome to our virtual bachelor's degree expo. My name is Tracy Glidden. I'm the coordinator of student recruitment here at Eastern Florida State College. We are glad you are here tonight and we are excited to introduce you to some of our faculty who will be presenting on programs that they teach in here in our bachelor's degrees at Eastern Florida State College. Make sure that you click the link below to sign in, even if you already registered for the event, that way we will be able to send you important information after this session, um, including information about how to use the application waiver at the end. Um, so here's what we have for you tonight. Um, you'll get an overview of what Eastern Florida has to offer and how specializations can customize to your education. We have some great faculty presentations. During these presentations and in between, you'll learn about curriculum, resources, and other important information about becoming a bachelor's student at EFSC. Be sure to use the chat feature in this YouTube event to post your questions as we will be answering them as we go along. Here is the presentation schedule. You can find a link to the schedule also below with the details and times of each presentation. Bachelors, faculty, and advising will provide a close look at some of the content you will learn in our programs. In the essence of maintaining a safe environment for our presenters, these sessions were pre-recorded. However, following each session, we will have the presenter live by phone to answer any questions that you have. We will also have our bachelor's degree advising coordinator, Lisa Denninghoff, and our assistant director of financial aid, Jennifer Pate, available in the YouTube chat room to answer any enrollment or financial aid questions. Before we get to the faculty presentations, I'd like to first give you a brief history and overview of EFSC's bachelor's degrees. In response to local industry needs, we began offering bachelor degrees in 2013. These degrees are directly related to the in-demand careers in our region. They were identified from a state list of targeted sectors where job growth was expected with a specific emphasis on high wage, high need jobs. Businesses of all types and sizes throughout Brevard were surveyed to determine their greatest needs and our degrees align with these needs. In our first semester offering BAS degrees, we accepted 326 students. This was well over the expected first year enrollment. And the first graduating class in the 2014-2015 school year was 59 graduates. This school year we will have 402 graduates and in total have, over, have graduated over 1,400 students in the seven years since we began offering them. The program continues to grow as we are adding more and more specializations within our four bachelor's degrees based upon assessments of the growing needs in our community. To learn more, visit easternflorida.edu slash go slash bachelors. The growth in popularity and enrollment in our bachelor's degrees is exciting. At Eastern Florida, earning your bachelor degree is affordable and convenient. Offering local options for students allows them to stay close to their homes and their families, and it makes it easier for working students to continue their education. We have classes on all four campuses and online. You'll save over 40% at Eastern Florida in comparison to public universities in Florida. Our standards and accreditation are equal to those of state universities. Classes are small, limited to 25 to 30 students, allowing for more personalized in instruction. Our standards and accreditation are equal to those of state universities. If you've already earned an AA or AS degree, you'll have automatic acceptance to most of our bachelor programs. If you don't have an AA or AS yet, you should apply first to that degree. Once you finish, you're eligible to apply for a bachelor's at EFSC. Many of our bachelor programs are offered fully online and hybrid courses are offered as well. How long will it take to complete? This varies from student to student. The length of time depends on the program, how many courses you have already, and the pace at which you want to work. There are multiple options within each semester. Your bachelor advisor will be able to give you more details based upon your program. So what are your options? There are four major bachelor degrees at EFSC, one bachelor of science degree, RN to BSN, and three bachelor of applied science degrees. These are in organizational management, applied health sciences, and computer information systems technology. Within these degrees are 23 different specializations, some of which you will hear about tonight. There are many different specializations within our bachelor's degrees. What is a specialization? It is a track that offers unique coursework to meet your specific career and academic goals. For example, you may earn a bachelor's degree in organizational management with a specialization in public administration. 
Let's take a look. Here on our website, you can see a list of these specializations. Specializations within the Applied Health Sciences Bachelors. You can see that we have several in the Applied Health Sciences Bachelors degree, specializations within the Computer Information Systems Technology, and specializations within Organizational Management B, uh, degree. As you can see, there are many offered 100% online. Coming up next, we have a presentation from Dr. Nicole DeCaro on the foundations of managerial, account, account, uh, managerial communication. This course is found within the core curriculum for all specializations within the organizational management degree. So if you're considering organizational management, you will take this course, maybe even with Dr. DeCaro. Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you today. Just yesterday morning, I happened to look at my phone and I'm Googling for the latest business news, which I do typically every day. And the first headliner that comes up quite astounded me. It stated that there are over 205 billion, with a B, emails sent globally every day. And I thought about that, especially knowing I would be here today speaking with you about communication. And my question to you is, how many of those 205 billion emails came from you? How many emails did you contribute to that number? How many did I contribute to that number? It's yesterday's felt to me that I contributed 204 billion emails, although we know that's not quite right. The point is, is whether you contributed one or whether you contributed a billion emails, whatever it is that you did, that transmission counts because it's a form of communication. It's one that we use just about every day. Sometimes it seems as though we're doing it every minute from a business perspective, from a personal perspective, from an academic perspective. So what we transmit, what we say, how we package that transmission is very important. Have you ever found that, let's say in an email forum now, we're gonna find that communication takes many other modalities other than email. Have you found that in any written transmission that your re the response you expected was not what you expected? and it left you frustrated and you said, well, I, I packaged out all the information. I made my demand a, a certain way. I asked for this, I informed people that we were gonna have this meeting at nine o'clock and yet I didn't get the response that I expected. Well, that's because we have to look at the foundations of managerial communications, which is the name of this course. Although I don't like to call it a course because it truly is a lifestyle. Communication is at the foundation of everything we do. So you say, well, I've heard that word before and I'm tired of hearing it. Communication is common sense. All you have to do, just let people know what you want, what you're doing, what's going on, what's happening in the world, what's happening in your world, and you should be good to go, right? And no. My answer to you is that if that were the case, if communication skills were common sense, then why is it that we don't have 100% communication-free transmissions. If we had communication that was done correctly all the time, we'd have peace and harmony, there'd be no misunderstandings, no hurt feelings, and business would be productive and we would move forward accordingly. But that's not necessarily the case. Understand the definition of communication. Again, a foundation, a foundation is a solid uh, stanchion from which we build upon similar to a house, all right? You've got a strong foundation, that house is gonna stand. Not necessarily though, unless you continue to build with the appropriate resources of that house so it can continue to stand strong and last a very long time. So what inherently is considered a foundation of communication? Number one, you have to want to ensure that your communication style, whether it's verbally and writing, is, is crafted in a way that could be understood clearly. You have to want to make that effort. You have to want to have it happen. Because if you don't, it's not as interesting, it's, it's not as fun. You say, I want to be interesting to people. Well, if you want to be interesting to people, you have to be interested in people. You have to be interested in what turns people on to what you're doing whether you want to have a meeting, whether you want to introduce a new product. And by the way, 
foundations of managerial communication doesn't exclude anybody. Whether you want to be a CEO or you're a CEO of a multinational corporation, whether you want to have your own mobile dog grooming business, which incidentally does quite well these days, uh, you want car detailing, whatever it is that you want to do, whether it's law enforcement, retail, real estate, banking, finance, accounting, this is for you because great leaders are great communicators. The definition of communication is also at the heart and foundation of why we look to be more effective in our communication skills. The definition of communication is, it is the language of leadership. Communication is a multiplier of knowledge. I'll say it again, communication is a multiplier of knowledge. Well, what does that mean? You can have more degrees than a thermometer. If you cannot impart information on people efficiently, where it's understood the way you have packaged it to be understood and avoid misinterpretation, which can still happen, but you do your best to ensure that that doesn't happen, what good is that information if it is not shared? The more you share knowledge, the more it multiplies, and you do that through forms of communication. That is the whole foundation behind that. So you have to have the belief that you can improve, and by the way, communication is teachable which means it's learnable, so it's okay, okay? You can, you can improve your skills. You can improve them effectively, even if this much, it's better than nothing, and it's all good. What I'm gonna show you today are some very basic, seemingly simple strategies that you can start to improve upon your communication skills right now, right today, right now, and we're gonna get in, in, into that shortly, all right? So again, if whatever walk of life you are interested in, this is something that is important for you to consider. In the classroom, I enjoy making this class a very experiential class, learning by doing, having people come not only speaking in front of you, but working with you, where we all together practice skills, because communication is, is, is exactly that. We practice together. People communicate in different ways through sign language, many, many ways. We also discuss communication uh, strategies with multiculturalism, all kinds of diversity. And it's just amazing what you can find across the board, generationally and uh, culturally, in terms of sharing ideas and skills and being able to communicate regardless of any perceived barriers. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to first uh, show you a couple of ideas. There are words that we use in our communication that can do us in. There could be very detrimental words if they're not used correctly. And I'm going to start with you right now, for example, back to the foundation of how to improve our skills. The one first strategy we can do is we can stop and proceed with caution before all else. Stop and think and proceed with caution. What that means is true, choose your words very wisely because the meaning that you assign to them may not be the meaning that other people are perceiving them to be. These words are usually associated with probability and time. And what I'm speaking about is our first word. Our first word is always. We've used this word, you've probably used the word today. You probably, if you haven't, you'll probably use it. Probably is another word, by the way, which is, uh, is up there that's a word that can get us in trouble. But always, how many times do we do that? Let's look at this from a business perspective. I heard this in a bank about four weeks ago, even with the social distancing. And a loan officer was apparently telling a couple that, oh, people like you with down payments that you have and a decent credit rating always get approved always get approved. Now I'll ask you this, if you were that couple, if you were a member of that couple or that individual, what would you understand that to be? Many times people might think, well, this, this is in the bag. I'm gonna have this loan approved. What if there are other variables that we're not aware of that are involved that maybe that loan will not be approved? You've in essence made a statement that is not not the best statement that you could have made. That doesn't mean we all don't make mistakes. I understand that. But again, think about how you would word that. So let's look at another word. 
Let's look at our second word. Never. All right. We never have problems approving loans such as yours. All right. Never. Never means exactly what the word says. Never. Again, you're putting yourself in a position where if something does occur in this, in this transaction, this does not look favorably upon not only the loan officer, but upon the bank itself. When you communicate, sometimes you think you're communicating solely on your own ground, but you're representing other people. You're representing corporations. You're representing the industry. So you want to make sure, again, as clearly as possible so that you don't give false hopes to people, whether it's in the business world, whether it's academically or professionally. All right, let's look at the next word, one that we said before, probably. If I asked everybody in this room, uh, what does probably mean to you? Does it mean yes? Does it mean no? It means maybe, but maybe is not a definite yes, not a definite no. So it makes one co contemplate it and assign meaning to it that, again, may not necessarily be that correct meaning. Next word, usually. Situations such as yours usually go very smoothly, usually. All right, that can also be interpreted. A little bit safer maybe saying it doesn't necessarily mean it will, but most of the time it does. The idea is the more that your recipient has to think about what you're saying, the more of a margin of error increases for there to be uh, misinformation all right, or misguidance. So you always want to keep that in mind when you speak. And how you do that, again, when we look at strategies, you may want to assi assign percentages, all right? So instead of usually, I'll give you an example. 84% of the time, we have positive results in getting loans approved, okay? At least you have an idea, all right, there's a possibility I may be in that 84%, maybe I won't be, but at least we have an idea, some idea if that's the case. Let's see if we have another word in store. Oh yes, often, often. You're writing a questionnaire. You want to do a marketing survey, all right? How often do you drink orange juice? Every day. Well, if you leave a question open like that, I may think orange juice, well, I don't drink orange juice that much, maybe once a month. So, I don't know, maybe that is often for some people that maybe don't drink it at all. So you're left wondering, what is often? Maybe if you had a grid and said, never, seldom, often, sometimes, always, and give an idea, maybe one to two cups of orange juice, two to three cups of orange juice, you would give people a better idea of where they might fit in, in terms of that. And that is seriously important. Why? Because businesses and people make decisions upon the information and the data that is uh, extrapolated from your questionnaire responses. That is huge. So you don't want to be writing a brilliant answer to the wrong question because you did not provide guidance and clear explanation as to what you were looking for. That's what's key. Remember what I said in the very beginning about that. The basis and the foundation is that you want to believe and want to ensure that the communication you are bringing is understood as clearly as possible to your audience. Next word, oh my goodness, ASAP, as soon as possible. I need that report. I have a deadline to make by the end of the day. What's the end of the day? Oh, six o'clock PM, let's say. I'll have it for you ASAP. In my mind, ASAP means before I blink my eye, that paper's gonna be on my desk. But ASAP to the other person, that person may have something else that has, that's on, on, on that, their priority list. ASAP to them may mean, oh, if Dr. DiCaro gets it in an hour, she gets it in an hour. That's ASAP, as soon as possible for me. So you need to have an idea about when, uh, when ASAP is going to actually happen. Because this is where you get people with, again, hurt feelings, anger, uh, and distension and discord in the workplace. And that's not something you want to have, especially if you spend the majority of your day at work even more than home. So you want to have harmony. You want to have peace. So sometimes, Mm, I'll correct myself. Most of the times you have to work at that to get that harmony and peace. But it is worth it in the long run, short and long run. 
Let's look at another word. Caution. Soon. I'll see you soon. See you soon. There's actually another word, later. See you later, see you later. A lot of times, depending on who I'm talking to, I will say, see you later. That could be two weeks from now. But somebody else might say, oh, see you later. Oh, am I going to see you this afternoon? Am I going to see you later in the morning? What is that? But we use these words so often. And again, I, I can imagine some of you may be thinking, oh, these words we use every day. Again, common sense. Think about your words. Think about your words. There's no one, including myself, that has all of the experience in the world that can say we are 100% best communicators in the world. There's always room for improvement. To this day, I now am so conditioned to think about the words I'm using and make sure that I accompany those words with descriptives that will be helpful for my audience to remember. And that's at home, in business, on campus, everything. And believe me, after a while, it gets to be fun. When you learn something in the beginning, it's typically difficult. You know the, the old expression, the hardest part is getting started, all right? The hardest part is getting started, but make it fun because communication should be fun. It's your opportunity to shine. It's your opportunity to think about the other person that you're serving even more than yourself. Remember, if you want to be interested, uh, interesting, you need to be interested. What are other people looking for for you to tell them? That should be your motivator. That should be your driving force. Next word. Today, all right? How about I'll stop by sometime today. I'll see you today, all right? When, when today? What time, around when? Morning, afternoon? Because you say today and I have to, oh, I realize I have a meeting at two o'clock. And guess what? That person comes to your door at two o'clock. Well, I told you I'd be here today. You weren't here. Well, you never told me when I had a meeting. And then, and then here, the communication goes this way instead of this way. And all because this could have been avoided. You see professional relationships unravel all because maybe of one word. All right? That's why this is significant. And that's why this is so important to understand the meaning and the depth that communication and the study of communication, both as an art and a science, is very relevant to you. Tomorrow. Again, tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow there are 24 hours in a day. All right? Tomorrow can mean any of those hours. Oftentimes, if you're taking online classes, you'll, be, you'll have a, um, a guide where a discussion post or an assignment is due by uh, August 15th, 11.59 p.m., right? So at least you have an idea. All right, I have right before the midnight hour to get that work in. That's clear, that's understandable, and that is a good guide by which to follow. So again, make it clear, tomorrow when? Tomorrow by close of business. What? Always make sure. Think. Use caution. Think and proceed slowly. It is so worth it in the end. Right away. Right away. Again, maybe to you and I, right away means now. To somebody else, right away, they might not be able to get that right away. They may have to get approval from another individual before they allow you to go ahead with the information that you're seeking or, or seeking to impart on, on others. So right away, for somebody else, may be very appropriate to be an hour or two from now or even more, but you have to establish that understanding at the very beginning, at the onset, or at some point. I can have it for you right away. I'm not certain as to the time. I will let you know as I speak to the people I have to be speaking with in order to allow this to happen. At least you give people, show people that you care. Show people that you're taking the time, that you are important, you are of value, and I take you seriously. That's what you want to do. Okay, the final point I'm going to make here with you. We've discussed some of the words that can get us in trouble. Keep them in mind, and I'm sure when I, when I discuss this with, with students and with, with, uh, with, with folks, colleagues, I'm typically about 94%, 94% of people tell me that since then they continuously think now their words. What do I mean by tomorrow? What do you mean by tomorrow? And it works. Let's shift lanes for another minute with respect to the brevity of time we have. PowerPoint presentations, all right, PowerPoint, we, and by the way, this is not all exclusive of what we're discussing here, of what we do for the whole course. We do a number of wonderful elements and variations and, and communication, social media, a lot of aspects of communication are involved. I'm bringing up PowerPoint because a number of us do PowerPoint presentations and are asked to do PowerPoint presentations. Students, faculty, administrators, uh, business, business people, 
were asked to do PowerPoint presentations. The problem with that is PowerPoint can be your worst enemy if you don't use it correctly. PowerPoint, if you tell me, when I go into a meeting and I see the PowerPoint screen already lit up, my, my heart sinks, my heart sinks, all right? Or sometimes it goes into my throat because, oh no, here we are, I'm gonna be read to. PowerPoints, the idea of less power, more point, less power, more point. When you have slides and you're making a PowerPoint presentation, the title PowerPoint presentation should be rewarded. The PowerPoint is not the presentation. You are. You are the presenter. Your PowerPoint is an aid to you. It is just a little buddy that will give you a little supplementation to help you be the deliverer of that information. Unfortunately, we leave the power on, the electricity running, and those words and the whole presentation is written there on a slide that somebody has already read while you're still reading off a slide. And the, the issue with that is that if you're going to read verbatim off of your slide, why have a presentation or a demonstration? Why not just email your slides to your recipients because they can read that themselves. Give your audience what they're not expecting. Give your audience a little tidbit on a slide and then you can you can speak more on that. It'll get you used to relying on, on that PowerPoint as a crutch. It's not a crutch. Now, I know some of you out there are saying, well, wait, wait a minute now, Dr. Carroll, that's not going to work for me because I have to do a presentation to show a progression analysis of sales over the past five years, and you want me to do it in one word? Really? No, of course not. But there are beautiful ways to use infographics that can do a magnificent job of showing all your data in, a, in, 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 in an infograph form. And this is other things that we talk about that people say, oh, I see that based on this chart. Okay, I see the difference now. It looks a lot larger in numbers, the growth, than it does if you would have just read it to me off a slide because I can compare it with other lesser figures that are on that graph, uh, or the graphic, excuse me. So less power, more point. Get to the point of what you're doing. Give your audience the point of what, what it is they're looking for. And this is all part of the foundations that we have in managerial communications. Now, can you imagine? These are just a few little tidbits along with many more. But if you do a little at a time, you'll find that you can add to your toolbox a number of interesting resources that can help benefit you and more importantly, the people that you are serving and that will be learning and benefiting from you. You must multiply that knowledge. Communication is a multiplier of knowledge. Do your share, just like what was your share in the 205 billion emails that will go out every single day globally? What are you gonna do to do your share of multiplying knowledge vis-a-vis -vis communication? I look forward to seeing you in classes together and I'm not gonna say see you soon. I'm gonna say see you when it's the right time for you to be here. Thank you so very much. It's been a pleasure. Bless. Thank you, Dr. DeCaro. That was amazing. That was such a great little class that you just gave us. Um, it's <laughs> wonderful to have you with us. Well, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. It's an honor to be here. Now, I don't know if you were able to see the chat at all while this was playing, um, but I wanted to read something that really stood out to me. Um, one student asked, do sales mm -hmm. and marketing organizational managers, uh, management majors get to take Dr. DeCaro's class? It wasn't do I have to take it, or is it one of the classes I'm going to take? It's do mm -hmm. I get to take it? If they're in the BAS program, I believe it is a required course. Yes, but he's saying, do I mm -hmm. get to take it? And later on, he said, I'm looking forward to it. I can tell I will learn a lot in her class. Oh, so. my Lord. Isn't, Isn't that great? Just a little testament. Such a joy. Yeah, that is such a joy. And I, I love it. You know what's great about it, too, though? The fact that the student said this is I learn a lot, too. I learn all the time. Like I said in the presentation, you can have as many degrees as a thermometer. There is always room for learning more. And it's a mutual it's a mutual um, experience, so I appreciate Thank you for sharing that feedback. That's very nice to hear. Right, yeah, I do hear quite a bit from students um, that have taken your class, how much they enjoy it. And I know uh -huh. in our recruitment, uh, with different events that we've done, you've supported them every single time, and we just love having you join us for these events. 
Anytime. Thank you. Anytime. So I um, believe in what, what we're doing. Yes. Thank you. So tell us about yourself. How did you get into teaching and how long have you been teaching? It's interesting how I got into teaching. I'll try to keep this very brief. Um, I was always in business and in industry, and I was one time, I didn't have a master's degree or a PhD and all of that. I had a bachelor's degree, and one time I was asked to actually speak to a class about marketing and advertising, and I said, no, I really don't like school. I, I don't want to really go back and, and, and speak to college students, and they said, please, please do this as a favor. You know, that's it. I said, okay. I finally, I, I decided to go. I had such a wonderful time with it. And then I don't believe anything happens by accident anyway. There's always a, a purpose. And then they asked me to come back, and I <clears> continued <throat> it. And I really enjoyed The best part of it was that teaching gave me the opportunity to blend the theory with the practice because I had both. I don't stay a chapter ahead of the students. I've done this. I, I'm a doer. So to be able to blend both and give students that benefit, it's very significant to me. So I continued, got my uh, education furthered, and um, kept moving up there from there. Great. How long have you been teaching here at Eastern Florida? Oh, actually, well, since 2013, I've been full-time on the Coco campus, and I would say probably since 2007, I was adjuncting on the Melbourne campus. So I've been with Eastern Florida and BCC prior uh, for quite a few years, and I've loved it. I couldn't have been more honored when I was hired was right when we went into the bachelor's level. We became a four-year institution. And when I was asked the question, why do you want to come to Eastern Florida State College? I said, this is a monumental moment for the BCC turning into a four-year college where Eastern Florida State College, I would love to be a part of this. And I just, I just, my, my enthusiasm was just rolling over. It's not something you could fake, that's for sure. So... <laughs> That's great. That was, well, we're lucky to have it, you, that's for sure. Um, um, well, I, I feel lucky to be had by EFSC. That doesn't sound right at all. Does it? <laughs> <laughs> I think we know what you mean. I think we understand what you mean. Yeah. So what's one, yes. uh, one quick thing that you, could, uh, that you would say that students typically tell you after the class they wish they had known before they started your class that they've learned at the end of it? They had no idea that this was going to be so applicable from a management perspective, an administrative perspective, many students come into the course thinking it's going to be a typical speech class or a grammar class. Let's, let's do our verbs and our predicates and our pronouns, which, which that's part of it, but it's, a very, it's, it's not the whole, the whole um, course. They're very surprised that seemingly simple business communicators such as a handshake has changed their perspective on even handshaking. My class is experiential. I have mm. guest speakers come in. We have an amazing career uh, placement, uh, career service, and we have one of our planners, and I have to put her name in there, Ms. Casey Koval. Oh, she yes. Is amazing. She is she, great. Yes. She comes to the class. She does all kinds of workshops where she gets the students out of their seats yep. and shows you how to actually do a, a, a correct handshake. Because normally students think, just put your hand out. Da, 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 you're done. Right, no. right. Well, I know no. a lot of people are <laughs> looking forward to see, to uh, to taking your class. I appreciate you being here yeah. with us today. Um, and just thank you for supporting our event. I will support it constantly. I believe in Eastern Florida State College. I believe in all that you're doing, your amazing recruitment efforts, and I'm honored to be a part of that. Thank you so much. All right, great. So if you're just joining us, make sure you click the link below to check in. Coming up next, we have a presentation from Wayne Brown. Professor Brown has clinical and managerial experience in respiratory therapy and cardiopulmonary services. He's passionate about student success and is a faculty participant in our Minority Male Initiative. Hello everyone, my name is Wayne Brown. I am program manager for the Bachelor of Applied Science here at Eastern Florida State College. Uh, a little background um, about myself. I have over 25 years of experience uh, as a registered respiratory therapist. I've worked in small rehab facilities all the way to large level three trauma centers in New York in DC. So I just want to sort of give you a little overview um, of the healthcare specialization program here at Eastern Florida State College. Uh, first, I'll tell you what it is not. What it is not is blocked and courses where the students are expected only to um, 
you know, tests and, you know, there's PowerPoints and, um, you know, there's, you know, strict curriculum. While all these things are necessary and there to meet our objectives, um, the idea behind the healthcare specialization is to uh, provide a journey for you as a clinician or a non-clinician. Um, so the bottom line is, uh, while you may have experience as a clinician in a number of different fields, and you're interested in moving into a higher, uh, higher level uh, uh, positions, uh, there are others who may not have that firm background, but have the attributes. Um, so that's the whole focus, right? How do we then help you understand what your attributes are? Uh, do you have an idea of, of what your attributes are, uh, what, what your sense of, of empathy is? Um, so that's, that's the idea. It's, it's more than you know, just strict curriculum. Uh, uh, one of the foundations of um, the courses uh, is discussion. Discussion is extremely important. Um, now, I understand in this day and age where there may not be a whole lot of discussion with all the technology that we have um, you know, at our disposal, uh, discussion is extremely important in healthcare. So for my actual courses, um, I have two rules as far as discussion is concerned. One is you give me a reason why you are saying what you are saying. Give me the why, right? Is it something you know, something you feel um, in terms of your experiences and your knowledge base, but just not something sort of, you know, out of the blue, um, a quick thought. Um, that's the first rule. Second rule is uh, respect others' opinions and their thoughts and their contributions to the discussion, right? We do not live in a homogenous society. Um, you, we disagree with each other. Um, it's just how we disagree, right? So we disagree respectfully, um, but we're open to others' ideas, even though we may not agree um, in the long run, right? So basically, we want to build your foundation um, with the healthcare specialization program. So you'll be taking the introduction to healthcare administration courses. You'll be taking uh, healthcare finance uh, courses. Um, the whole idea is to pull these courses together as you go through your journey, and it is a journey, right, for your education and your success, right? Throughout your journey, you're collaborating, you're focused on these individual courses that basically is pieces of the puzzle leading to the um, capstone program. So the capstone program or course actually comes at the end of your academic uh, uh, career uh, in the bachelor program. Uh, typically, students uh, take the capstone the very last uh, semester, and it is a requirement to graduate. Now, the course is designed to, like I said, pull all the courses or most of the courses that you've actually um, uh, studied over the previous uh, several semesters and pull it all together, right? So the bottom, and, and then, therefore, if once you have this background, you can do something that hopefully you're doing now, um, but it's extremely important, that is critically thinking, right? critically thinking and problem solving. How do you solve the concerns and the issues of your, your healthcare environment? How do, you re, how do you resolve the issues in terms of say interpersonal conflicts, right? Those are the things, those are the core pieces that hopefully you get to towards the end and establishing your capstone program. Uh, another large piece of the capstone program is the internship uh, requirement. Now that is a, a 40 uh, hour requirement um, that you would experience you know, throughout the, the term. Um, there are times when students actually have a site there they are uh, interested in and participating. Um, that has to be an environment that you're not working in. Um, so there's no double dipping where you're getting paid to and then you know, gaining credit for an internship at the same uh, site or department. Um, we also have an excellent, excellent um, career center team who will help and support you and help find you a site if you don't have one that you uh, have available to you or uh, that you are interested or have any knowledge about. They will actually help uh, you uh, find a site. They also monitor the, the paperwork process. Uh, like I indicated, they're an excellent team. They will work with you. Um, and provide you uh, the resources that you need to be successful during your internship. Now, the goal of the internship, once you get to that point, the goal of the internship is to provide you an experience in healthcare. And, and it can vary from the hospital to a physical therapy site, 
um, on and on. Um, what I hope that you have is a positive experience. Uh, but not once have I promised that the experience will always be positive. Um, oh, there are times, you know, since you're now in the real world, not everything runs as smooth as we would like it, but the idea is to have that experience and to be able to step forward, show a sense of professionalism, um, where they will then, most sites will have you get involved in their operations. I've had students tell me, um, you know, they've been able to sit in on meetings, they've been able to sit in, sit in on interviews. I've had a student tell me that there's an issue or concern or problem that a facility was having and they basically you know, laid that in front of her and asked if she would take a look at it and provide her thoughts. She wrote up a proposal and that went all the way to the CEO. So there's a vast amount of opportunities, right? So you represent yourself at these different sites. And I focus on that in terms of being a sense of professionalism, um, having that sense of professionalism because it's so important in terms of your, your career moving forward, right? So you go into your site and um, you carry yourself appropriately. Um, you open yourself up to learn, uh, then there's obviously going to be more opportunities that, that come your way. So I'm very excited about uh, the internship program. We've had some, some, some great success. We've obviously had students who uh, have been employed prior to their graduation. Um, and, and, and that to me is, is um, sort of the end result as you start your journey. Right? So when you think about the program overall, I want you to think of it as um, as, as a collaboration of courses, not individual courses, not just the, the letter grade or the, the you get, um, focus on the intent of the actual program. And the intent is to provide, like I said, that foundation of healthcare, culminating into uh, a sense of leadership, right, moving forward. Um, so that's, that's where we are. Um, I hope it also provides you a sense of self-reflection so you have a, a Hopefully, some of them understand where do you fit in healthcare, right? Where do you fit in terms of who you are as an individual? Um, do you prefer the front line? Do you prefer a, a leadership role? Are you not absolutely sure yet? Hopefully, this program will provide you uh, those resources that you can, in fact, self reflect and be extremely successful uh, moving forward. So, with that, um, I will uh, leave you. Um, I wish you all well. Uh, again, I want to give a shout out to the advisors, um, to the Career Center registration uh, for us. It's also a collaborative effort, and we're all here for your success. So take care, uh, be safe, and we'll talk soon. Thank you, Mr. Brown, for joining us and for giving us that great presentation about healthcare management specialization. Thank you. Happy to be here. Good to have you. Um, we you. did have a question. We have a couple of questions that are kind of rolling in, so I'm just going to read them off of the chat. Um, okay. The first one is about the internships. Do they have to be unpaid? Now, that would be a question that I would um, send to the Career Center. Uh, Ms. Schuler um, is the expert, and she has a, a great team. Um, so while, as far as I can recall, the internships we've had in the past were all um, unpaid. I, I don't want to speak to whether or not it's something that's accepted, you know, acceptable. So yeah, Ms. Uh, Lisa Schuler would be the uh, individual who would um, be able to help with, with that information. Okay, great. And yes, we do have um, a video from Lisa that is explaining some of the internships that we'll be showing later on in this uh, event. Another question okay, about internships, uh, wanting to know about the locations for internships for biomedicine. Okay, so the biomedicine segment of it is actually Dr. Chris Petrie. So I can sort of give an idea in terms of how our internship works. I suspect there is a lot of commonality between the healthcare specialization and the biomed piece uh, in terms of how the internships work. The biomed is under the course HSA 4851, and their whole course is a capstone. There is no curriculum work in terms of discussions in class. It's all based on an internship site. So how the internship site actually, um, actually culminates, uh, a student may have uh, some preferences. They may have one or two sites that they are interested in uh, participating uh, in, and they would bring that information to, again, the Career Center. Um, if a student does not have, there are certain rules in terms of the internship site. So uh, the first rule is this. 
um, you are not allowed to be working at the same site. Now, you can perhaps work a different shift, but you can't work at the same time and then earn credits for an internship uh, that I indicated in the, uh, the presentation there. So in terms of actually acquiring it, you have some uh, latitude in terms of an internship site you may be interested in. It may work out better for you in terms of logistics and location and so on. If you have no clue, no idea where you would like to intern, uh, that's where the Career Center comes in and they help support finding your location uh, of specific internship site. Um, the thing I will definitely uh, say is important is if you start this process early. So um, that's extremely important. And we've actually started to uh, put together a program where we have and we can track students who will be in the capstone course uh, one or two semesters in the future, if you would. And then we start that process uh, uh, in terms of the internship site at that point. So it's not just bumping up right against the actual uh, term where they actually will be taking the capstone course. Um, so that biomed piece, that's sort of commonality. I'm sure there are other variables because I said the biomed is a different um, a segment um, from healthcare right. specialization. Yep. And uh, Dr. Petrie can give more detail on that. Yeah, and I think that's a common uh, misunderstanding. It's just to clarify the, the four different degrees that we offer, the RN to BSN, the organizational management, the allied health science, and the computer information technology, each have specializations that fall under them. Um, healthcare management, which which is what you're talking about, falls under organizational management. You would think, you know, maybe there's a misunderstanding because it might fall under the health because you're in healthcare. Um, but the biomedical and the biotechnology falls under um, the um, applied health science bachelor's degree. So there is some overlap probably, like you were saying, about where the internships would be located. Um, and uh, more information for internships can be found through our um, in internship office. Lisa Schuler uh, will be talking about those later on in the show. And uh, we will have links. Um, if you look below the video here, you can see there's several different resource links that you can use to uh, identify some of the information that might answer the questions that you have. Those are great questions. Internships are such an important part of the bachelor's programs. Um, so one, one last thing, uh, just a, a quick word of advice to students who are looking at this particular program. Sure, um, what, what I would say just from, from the start, um, number one, um, it's very important that you know and feel confident in terms of healthcare. So I, I talk to my students all the time, um, know that um, and it is it's so beyond, you know, just getting a good paycheck and so on and so forth. And, and, and so unfortunately, I can use what's happening currently to sort of express what I'm saying. Right. Healthcare is not for everyone, right? So it, it, the bottom line is you have to do a little self-reflection and see if this is something you want to do because healthcare should, in your, in your mind and in your heart, supersede everything else. And when I say that, what I mean to say is it should supersede race, religion, sexual orientation, right. uh, you name it, all those things, right? So in other words, health care needs to be something that's a global thing that, that you feel in a sense of empathy. Um, that's the starting gate there. And then from, from that point, you feel, yes, this is something that I want to do. Yeah. Um, then you go and find out what the, the things, uh, the areas of interest uh, that, that, you, um, that you may have. Volunteerism is a huge way to get into the hospital environment, to make contacts, to, to get folks to know who you are, um, and, and therefore, you have a better uh, feel for what healthcare is. And you actually thank you, thank you so it. much. Um, hopefully, yes, um, if I could ask you to, we are running out of time here, but if you could okay, stay on the chat, I noticed that you were on the chat earlier. If you want to stay on the chat, and maybe if you notice any other questions that come up relevant, you could just sure. go ahead and answer those. Um, thank you so Absolutely. much for joining us. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back. Although we live in uncertain times, life can't be put on hold. Continuing your college education is too important to your future. Eastern Florida is here for you this summer offering 100% online classes taken from the safety of your home. Even though your finances may have been impacted by recent events, we stand ready to help every student secure the grants, payment plans, and other aid that will allow you to continue your education. Don't worry. Working together, we can make it happen. 
Summer term registration is now open and our team is standing by to assist you with signing up for classes and financial aid. Reach us by phone, email, or chat. Contact us today. taking classes at Eastern Florida State College over the summer. Well, with everything going on, there's nothing really much else to do except for learn. If there was any point in skipping a semester or putting a pause in my education when I'm so close to being finished. My professors have been incredibly adaptive. Online classes seems like the optimal solution. Life happens and you have to take things by storm. Build a successful career with a bachelor's degree from Eastern Florida State College. You can choose from nearly 25 tracks in today's top job fields of business, healthcare, and computer technologies, with classes tailored to meet your needs on campus and online. A bright future awaits you with a bachelor's degree from Eastern Florida State College. To learn more, visit easternflorida.edu slash go slash bachelors. Quarantine. Social distancing. Shelter in place. Flatten the curve. This is becoming our new normal, but that doesn't mean it has to impact your education. Here at Eastern Florida, these unprecedented times don't change our purpose. Your success is still our top priority. We're not alone. We're navigating this together. Although campus offices are closed, we're working remotely to meet your needs. We have online resources to help you finish the semester strong. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us by phone, email, or chat. We've got you covered. Check out our virtual student services guide during COVID-19 closures at easternflorida.edu slash go slash remote. Remember, we've got you. We've got you. We've got you. We've got you. We're in this together. 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 Go Titans. Go Titans. Go Titans. Discipline equals freedom. Study, study, study. Study hard. Do all your homework. Work hard. Always do your work. Study. Focus, concentrate. Study hard. Be focused. Don't give up. Keep at it. Keep working hard. Just keep pushing. Don't give up. Be determined. Never give up. Procrastinate. Do not wait until like 11 o'clock to get your homework done. <laughs> Don't procrastinate. Because if you do, then you're going to get behind. Reach out for help. Definitely use the learning lab. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Be humble and ask for help when you need it. Go to the learning lab. Tutoring really does help. Get to know your teachers really well. Always go to your teachers for support. Get close with your professors. And appreciate your teachers because they're amazing. Getting to know your fellow students. Have fun, make friends. Get to know people. Don't be afraid to just, you know, step out of your box. Have fun with it. Follow your dreams. Maintain the vision. Set goals. Follow your dreams. I know these have been some challenging times and we've all had to make adjustments, like moving to online classes. Given the current circumstances, I am loving these online classes. 
have given me that opportunity to adapt. I am feeling really motivated to continue my classes online and also feeling really safe. Taking online classes is the best way to go because it will help slow down the spread of COVID-19. You got this, Titan. Although we live in uncertain times, life can't be put on hold. Continuing your college education is too important to your future. Eastern Florida is here offering 100% online classes taken from the safety of your home. We stand ready to help every student secure the grants, payment plans, and other aid that will allow you to continue your education. Summer term registration is now open, and our team is standing by to assist you with signing up for classes and financial aid. Contact us today. Hello, welcome back. If you're just joining us, make sure that you click on the link below to check in. Uh, it's really important that you do that so that we can send you information after the event about the application, how to use that application fee waiver, because you know if you apply during this event, uh, you would actually get that $30 application fee waived. So make sure you check in below and even more uh, even more resources are available below there. If you scroll down or you click on the See More, you can see that we have a digital view book that has information on all of our bachelor's degree programs, including the ones that we're highlighting tonight. Um, and we also have resources, uh, information about scholarships, financial aid. We have awesome academic success centers that you can see with our free tutoring. So make sure you check out those links after the show and um, use those to be successful. Here at Eastern Florida, that's what we really want is to see our students uh, be successful, to see them go on to finishing their bachelor's degree and seeing them on the graduation stage, and then going on to a career based on what they learned here. That's what we're all about here. Um, as you could see from the videos, all of those people are working from home um, during this time and still supporting you, still wanting to help you be successful, still wanting to help get you connected to um, the departments, the resources that you need to be successful. Um, if you missed it, if you're just joining us, um, we did have a wonderful presentation, uh, two presentations that fall under our organizational management degree. One of them was by Dr. DeCaro about effective communication within business. And then with we just had Wayne Brown on the line with information about the healthcare management specialization within the organizational management degree. So next, next up, we have um, the RN to BSN program. So um, it's really important that you understand it is a bachelor's degree program for the, R, uh, for the BSN. However, it's important that you have that RN first. So um, students who are currently in the RN program, if you're in that last semester, you're getting ready to get your license, um, those are the students that should be applying for the bachelor's program, the BSN, or if you are already working as a nurse, you've already earned that AS degree and you have your RN and you want to get that higher degree, come to us with your current license information and proof that you have that associates in nursing and we'll be able to um, admit you into the BSN program. Many more details are going to come with Lisa Denninghoff. She's going to be on the line after the presentation. Um, presentation's going to have a great amount of information about how the program works, how you can get connected to the program, what the curriculum looks like. All of those details are going to be explained. Um, Lisa Denninghoff is going to be available afterwards for chat uh, questions afterwards. And she's also going to be available at the end of the pro program to answer questions through the chat feature on all of the programs. She's not just uh, the advisor for the RN to BSN, she is an advisor for all of our bachelor's degrees, all of our specializations. So she is the one to talk to uh, with any questions that you have. So Lisa Denninghoff has been a part of our bachelor's program since 2013, since the beginning in 2013. And she's had a hand in advising and supporting all of our students through this program. So I'm really excited for you to see that. And that's what's coming up next. Thanks for joining us. Let's get started. Eastern Florida State College has been offering an RN to BSN degree since 2018. 
We've had several graduating classes. We are CCNE accredited. And at this time, we have about 200 to 250 students in the program. A common question is, what is the difference between an RN and a BSN? Traditional RN job includes simple nursing care, recording patient symptoms, supporting the family, patient education, and working in close consultation with doctors. With a BSN, you would do those things as well as more complex procedures, and you would be able to be in charge of other nursing staff. You would be able to uh, advance into leadership positions and receive higher pay. The benefits of earning a degree at EFSC include the program is 100% online, it's cost effective, could result in a salary increase for you, and earning your BSN may become a requirement in your current job. This is a 100% online program. The core courses are listed here, there are 10 of them, and then you would select two of the elective courses for a total of 35 credits in 12 courses. Our tuition has not increased since we initiated our program. We still charge $128.51 per upper division credit hour. So for those 35 credit hours I mentioned in the last slide, it would be around $4,500. There would be an additional fee per course for the distance learning aspect of the program, and books would not be included in that number. If you required any lower division classes, and we'll get to the possibility of that in a minute, those would be at our regular rate of $104 per credit hour. Regarding the increase in salary, uh, Florida entry-level nursing positions uh, run around $66,000, and with a BSN, you could move up to around seventy-five. dollars uh, With specialization, you could even exceed that. For some time, uh, the uh, Moving from your RN to your BSN has been uh, very encouraged. The Institutes of Medicine recommend that 80% of all nurses should hold a BSN by 2020, and that's the year we're in right now. So we're living that uh, recommendation. This also refers to uh, legislation known as BSN in 10, uh, which, is in, which encourages nurses to obtain their BSN within 10 years of becoming a registered nurse. This uh, is not a law in every state, but currently it is the law in New York, not in Florida. Um, it's possible that other states could follow suit. Let's discuss some of the EFSC admission requirements. First of all, you do need a two-year degree in nursing, an AS or an AAS, from a regionally accredited institution. You would also need an active Florida nursing license. Part of the application process is inputting your nursing license number, and then faculty will check that with the registry to make sure that it is active, clear, and unencumbered. If you don't have your nursing license yet, but you're in your last semester of your ADN, you can also apply to the program for the next coming term. Um, in place of your license number, you would just put the date where you, when you plan to take the, the NCLEX, or at least an estimate of that date. That way we can go ahead and move your application forward, accept you, and uh, then you can uh, move forward with the program. We wouldn't allow you to register for classes or any of the upper division classes until you did provide us with that license number. Another part of the application process is submitting all of your final uh, official transcripts from any colleges that you've been to. The exception to that would be EFSC. We already have uh, the transcripts with us or any transcripts that you've already submitted to us previously that we still have on file. Those transcripts would need to be submitted by the application deadline, which we'll get to in a few slides. General education courses are part of the BSN program. Some of them you may have completed uh, in advance. Um, others you may not have completed, and we would work those into your BSN program. Those are graduation requirements. The general education requirements that are required for graduating from the BSN program at EFSC uh, are here on the screen. Um, if you also have an AA degree as well as an ADN, you probably have already completed all of these. Generally, the ones that I see most often that are not completed are COM2, College Algebra, Statistics, and possibly One Humanities. 
And again, we just take whatever you haven't done and work it into your BSN plan. Here are the application steps for uh, filling out your application with us. Uh, it's very easy. You go to our main webpage, www.easternflorida.edu, and click the green apply button that you'd find on the right hand side of the screen. If you have not graduated from EFSC with either an AA or an AS degree, then a $30 application fee would apply to you. You would need to order any non EFSC college transcripts that we don't already have on file and get those to us. Once uh, you are accepted, you'd receive an acceptance letter. Then you would complete an online orientation, make an appointment with bachelor degree advising, and then register for classes. This is our application schedule. You can see that our summer application has already closed, but the fall application is open and will remain open until May 24th. The decision day for the fall applicants is June 4th. At that point, we will let you know uh, whether you've been accepted or not. And remember, uh, the application and the transcripts all need to be in by the application close date of May 24th. We hope you'll consider uh, joining us in our RN to BSN program. We'd love to have you. And if you have any questions, please do leave them in the comments. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for all that great information. And thanks for joining us for some Q&A time. Sure. So um, you mentioned that this program started in 2018. So it's a fairly new program. Yes. Um, how many, do you know, uh, how many graduates or have you heard from our graduates? Uh, what we've had, being that it's about a two year program, uh, most of our students go part time. So it does take them, you know, a little bit to get through. Um, We've had probably about 10, 10 graduates so far okay. uh, from the program and about two, two semesters, two, two graduation semesters. So, so how does that work? You said they're taking it part time. Is that because they're working uh, oh, yeah. as a nurse while they're, while they're taking the classes? Absolutely. Um, I would say that uh, the vast majority of my students are working nurses. So how does that work with their schedule if they're, um, you know, if they're on shift, how do they know or how are they able to balance that? Well, all the classes are online. It's a 100% online program. Um, unlike with the ADN program, which is cohorted and you have to take a certain amount of classes each semester and you, you take all those classes at the same time with that cohort that you come in with, um, we do not do it that way for the BSN program. They're able to take as many or as few classes as they wish. So uh, they pretty much are in charge of their own time and schedule. Okay, great. So they can take it at their own pace then. Um, as far as how many classes they take in a semester, each semester still has its own um, deadlines and uh, requirements as you go along. It's still going to be a 16 or 12 or 8 week session. Okay, and they have to take the courses in a particular order as well. Is that true? It's recommended. Um, there is some give to that. Uh, the only thing that we have that's really um, in stone, so to speak, is a prerequisite for statistics for one of the classes, but the faculty has um, told us in what order we would like to have, they would like to have the students take the courses that would benefit them the most. Okay, great. So students who have an associate's degree can apply to our bachelor's programs, um, but for this specific one, they have to have an AS in nursing. Correct. So what, what advice do you, would you give to a student who's earned their AA and yet now they want to do the BSN? Well, um, they would have to apply for, our, for the AS in nursing degree. Um, they could do that with us. Uh, for EFSC, that is a limited access program, which means there's a competitive application process, and that's for the two-year degree. For the bachelor's degree, it is not competitive, and it is not limited access. So they would have to do what they needed to do to get into that AS program, either with us or with some other accredited institution. Okay, great, great. And so our BSN program, basically, if you meet the requirements and you apply by the deadlines, then your assured that you're going to be getting into the program. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. Very great. Okay. Very good. All right. Um, so is there any other information, uh, any other questions that students usually ask you when you're 
meeting with them, advising with them that would be beneficial for the people who are watching this to know? Um, well, they sometimes ask um, about if they can go on to a master's level, and uh, certainly they can. Our program is CCNE accredited, which means that this degree transfers into the master's in nursing program that you would find anywhere uh, in any different um, institution. Okay, great, that's great information. I'm sure um, as the requirements start to increase, as students are in need of getting that BSN in order to have a regular job, um, to be able to move up into higher paid, higher level system, uh, career fields, then they, they can move on to that master's level with our bachelor's, with our BSN. Yes. All right, great. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. And um, if you guys You're have welcome. questions for Lisa, she is going to be in the chat answering questions near the end of the session. So please go ahead and type any of those questions you have about any of our bachelor's programs. Um, and thanks again, Lisa, for joining us. All right. Thank you for having me. All right, remember if you haven't already done so, sign in, click the link below to sign in. And um, we're gonna take another quick break and then we'll be back with a presentation from Thomas Highsmith on our nonprofit management and our public administration programs. Discipline equals freedom. Study, study, study. Study hard. Do all your homework. Work hard. Always do your work. Study. Focus, concentrate. Study hard. Be focused. Don't give up. Keep at it. Keep working hard. Just keep pushing. Don't give up. Be determined. Never give up. Procrastinate. Do not wait until like 11 o'clock to get your homework done. <laughs> Don't procrastinate. Because if you do, then you're going to get behind. Reach out for help. Definitely use the learning lab. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Be humble and ask for help when you need it. Go to the learning lab. Tutoring really does help. Get to know your teachers really well. Always go to your teachers for support. Get close with your professors. And appreciate your teachers because they're amazing. Getting to know your fellow students. Have fun, make friends. Get to know people. Don't be afraid to just, you know, step out of your box. Have fun with it. Follow your dreams. Maintain the vision. Set goals. Follow your dreams. Although we live in uncertain times, life can't be put on hold. Continuing your college education is too important to your future. Eastern Florida is here offering 100% online classes taken from the safety of your home. We stand ready to help every student secure the grants, payment plans, and other aid that will allow you to continue your education. Summer term registration is now open, and our team is standing by to assist you with signing up for classes and financial aid. Contact us today. All right, welcome back. Um, just want to go over again a few of the links below the, the screen. I can show you what it looks like here um, under the YouTube, under the YouTube uh, screen. You can see that there's links. Um, click here to sign in for this event. Again, if you haven't done that yet, if you're just joining us, please go ahead and do that so we can send you the important information about applying after the event. Um, the bachelor's degree digital view book is here. And we also have all of these financial aid scholarships, resources, academic success center, uh, career coach, success tips. We've got you some of the videos that we've already played, but some that you haven't seen yet. All useful information. Now we're gonna see, coming up next, Thomas Highsmith on nonprofit management and public administration. 
As you will see, Professor Highsmith is passionate about connecting. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Professor Thomas Highsmith, and I'm, I'll be talking about the public administration program and the nonprofit program here at Eastern Florida State College. First, we're going to talk about the public administration specialization. It consists of five courses, so we'll talk about the five courses. The first one is Public Administration and Management, which is PAD 403. It's, it's the introduction course. It's the course that talks about the overarching public administration, all the different aspects of public administration. But it'll just, it'll be a broad topic. It won't be the nuts and bolts like the other courses will be. So it'll give you some of the things that need to be talked about as far as uh, a little bit of this and a little bit of that as far as public administration, but it'll give you a, a, a overarching um, aspect of it and it'll be a lot of great information for you to see. And this is an awesome course. I have my master's degree in public administration, so it's gonna be a great time and I think you guys will enjoy this class. So the next course is public policy, development and implementation, PAD 4034. This class is awesome because you, when you deal with policies, we, a lot of us don't understand that there's policies in everything that we do. We deal with policies in everyday th aspects, especially what's going on right now. We're dealing with different policies, so we have to look at the, all the different policies that we're dealing with. You have federal policies, you have state policies, you have local policies. So we have to look at these different things. You have policies as far as uh, restaurants have their own policies because they have policies now where you can't go into the restaurants and eat. You have to pick your orders up to go. You look at different things like that. So, and you look at the federal government's policies, or the policies on the six foot distancing, things of, those, of that nature. So it gives you a, a great bit of different things when you talk about public policy. It talks about how you can, how policies are developed and how they're implemented. We talk about developing, you, you get information, you put it out there and you talk about develop, development. And then you go out there and then you implement these policies. Uh, and a lot of times policies aren't the things that a lot of people like to do, but policies are needed for people to be able, to, for the government to be able to run smoothly. Because when you're talking about public administration, you're talking about government. So the next course is public budgeting and finance. A lot of people don't understand when you look at public budgeting and finance, each sector has their own uh, budget and they have to uh, spread it out amongst the different uh, things that they do. Like you can look at, for instance, like Palm Bay has their own um, budgeting, a budget. So they have to spread it out among the different things. You have to look at the fire department, the police department. You have to look at the public works. You look at the park district. You look at all these other different things. So that's when you start talking about budgeting and finance. And budgeting and finance, you look at the federal government gives a budget to the states. Then the states have their budget out to the, to the counties. Then the counties spread it out to the different cities throughout the county. So that's when you start talking about public budgeting and finance. So if, when you look at that, it's, it's, it's a lot of different nooks and crannies in that. Budgeting and finance is not always the funnest thing for people to look at or see but it's a necessary thing because you have to have money to be able to run the government in that aspect. And then you look at urban regional, urban and regional planning, PAD 4330, which is probably one of my favorite courses. Cause when you look at public, when you look at urban and regional planning, you're talking about everything that we do from building police departments, from building subdivisions. Cause when you build a new town, you have to have things as far as like a police department, you have to have a fire department, you have to have streets, and you have to have other things within that, um, within that city. So that's part of urban regional planning. So you look at other things as far as uh, when you build uh, a shopping center, you have to have so many parking spaces, you have to have certain, you have to have ADA parking spaces, you have to have all these different things. So when you're looking at urban regional planning, you're talking about everything that you build. It has to be planned out, it has to be done the right way. Then you have public administration and governance. Public administration and governance is how the government governs the public administration. Because when you, when you look at uh, 
state and local, they have public administrators. But when you look at the federal government, they don't call them public administrators. They just call them, it's just people that administer the stuff. They're the overarching body. So when you look at the federal government, they don't, they make the rules and regulations, but they don't enforce them. The things, the people that enforce them are state and local government. So it's like, uh, say for instance, they talk about what's going on right now. You look at the 50 different states. They're like 50 different countries because, but the federal government is overarching because they look at them, they talk about it, they give them the rules that they need to enforce, and they, they're enforcing them the way that they want to. Because you have to look at each state is doing something different at this time. You look at, um, you look at uh, South Dakota, they're not enforcing things like they're doing in Florida because they don't have as many people and they don't have the outbreak that we have here as far as COVID-19. So each state does something different. Because you look at um, California, they went on lockdown way before everybody else. So it's about how you govern your different things. And that's talking about the state and the uh, local and federal. Now we're gonna talk about nonprofit management specialization, which is uh, near and dear to my heart because I do have a nonprofit. And I think this is something, cause you know, when you have a nonprofit, it's not about being rich or making money, but it's about giving back to the community. And we need to give back, we need to reach back and do things for people and, and be there for them. So the first class is my, um, nonprofit management principles. It just talks about the different things when you deal with nonprofits. It talks about uh, how, you st how you start a nonprofit, all the different things that you need to do to run your nonprofit. It talks about bringing in different people. Because um, some nonprofits you have met as little as one person. Some nonprofits have as many as 500 people. It just depends on how your, big your nonprofit is and who you're reaching and what you're trying to do. But with a nonprofit, it's, about, it's not about making money. It's about doing for people in the community and giving back to certain people, giving back to a different, different set. Because you have nonprofits for cancer, you have nonprofits for uh, battered spouses, you have nonprofits for foster children, you have nonprofits for all these different things. So what you're doing when you deal with nonprofits is you, feel, you find out what your passion is and what, whoever is in the nonprofit world, they have a passion for what they're, run, what they're trying to do. So that's what you, when you talk about nonprofits. Uh, then you talk about volunteer management. It's talking about managing your volunteers. And one of the biggest things about managing your volunteers is you need to keep them engaged. You need to keep them active. You need to have them feel as though they're part of what's going on. You want them to be able to feel as though they're making a difference and you have to reward them and give them, you know, it's not monetary rewards, but give them a pat on the back. Let them know that they're doing a great job, that you really appreciate them. And you want them to be able to uh, give you things, uh, give you feedback. And then when they give you feedback, just don't take their feedback and just throw it away. Take their feedback and try to implement it in some type of way to let them know that they are valued and that they mean a lot because a lot because you need volunteers because without volunteers you can't have your run your nonprofit being able to run um, next is pro program evaluation for nonprofits when you're talking about program evaluation you're evaluating your program your nonprofit you're trying to make sure that it's running on a straight and narrow you're making sure that what it was meant for that is actually taking place so when you have pe you have people that uh, come in and evaluate and look at what your nonprofit is doing and you want to make sure that your nonprofit is is really doing a great job and with the evaluation it kind of lets you know that certain things you're doing probably should be done a different way and it's always to have good to have constructive criticism it's not about getting criticized but it's constructive criticism it lets you know what you need to do for your program and how your program can be a lot better and run a lot smoother. Then you talk about resource development in the nonprofit uh, sector. So when you're talking about resource development, resource development is about reaching out into the community and finding people that can help you. It's not about, it's, it's not about uh, them, maybe they can help you monetarily or maybe they can give you other things that can help out in your nonprofit. 
It's about them giving you time, them setting you up with the right people. It's about building relationships. And anything that we do, we need to build relationships, especially when you're talking about the nonprofit sector. Building relationships means so much because you never know who you might meet that might be able to know somebody else that can know somebody else that can do something for you, that can put you into the right frame of what you need. And that's where, this, where you're talking about resource development. It's about building relationships and relationships last forever and you can make them work for you definitely until the end. Um, then you finally, you have grant development and administration. When you're talking about grant development, you're, about, you're talking about being able to physically sit down and write a grant for the federal government to be able to give you a grant for your nonprofit. And a lot of people don't realize there are hundreds, thousands of grants out there for people to go out and get for their nonprofit. All you have to do is sit down, put it on a piece of paper, and develop a grant, write the grant up, and try to seek approval from the federal government so that you can get that money to run your nonprofit. And what, a lot of people just act like they're too busy to be able to do these things, but you got to utilize all your different resources. When you're talking about grant development, that's about sitting down and putting it on a piece of paper. If you're not good at writing, find somebody. There's people out there that can help you write grants. And there's, there's people that you can hire to write your grant. They might ask you for a small portion of your grant, but there's people out there that can help you. But in this class, we're going to give you the nuts and bolts of how to start off and how to be able to write a grant. And it's about just being able to make it smooth, make a smooth transition. It's about seeking all your different avenues and finding out what you can do as far as getting money to run your nonprofit. And we definitely want to make sure that our nonprofits are run smoothly and that we can get utilize all our different resources and get the money that we actually need. So just in this in this nonprofit um, specialization, it is it's, it's about working hard and it's your what you get back from it is a lot of joy, a lot of smiles and a lot of things like that. It's not you're you're not going to ever get rich from it. I'm not going to say that you might not be able to make any money from it, but it's about seeing other people being able to uh, see what you receive, give them, have given them. And my nonprofit is about giving back to uh, foster kids. So I'm definitely, it's all about just giving back to people and letting them know that, hey, we're here for you and we can make everything work for you. And that is the end of my presentation. If there's any questions, please let me know. And thank you for all your time. Thank you, Thomas Highsmith, for that great presentation. And thanks for being here to answer some questions. It's my pleasure, Tracy. Uh, I look forward to answering any questions that you have for me. Well, one of the things I notice as I'm watching your presentation that it's clear to see that you're passionate about these two specializations from personal experience. Isn't that right? Oh, yes, definitely from personal experience. Uh, it's, it's a great passion. My passion is about people and it's about giving back to people and helping people out when they when a lot of times they're not able to help themselves. Yeah, it's 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 clear to hear your passion in what you're doing. And um, I love to hear that um, the uh, the program itself, both of the programs are um, underneath of our organizational management. So they're specializations within organizational management. And your courses are specific to a couple of different avenues, the public administration and the nonprofit. Um, and uh, the public administration, we were talking about uh, this when you came and did your recording, how relevant that topic is right now to what's going on. Um, can you provide a little bit of insight to that and just kind of give us some some details on how important the public administration aspect of things are with what's going on in the world right now? Well, yeah, when you when you look at uh, the different public administration, you look at the policies that are being built right now, because you, you just had the govern, governor come on um, yesterday and talk about it, that they were doing a slow rollback, a soft opening back opened up 25% of the retail market. So you only have 25% of the people being able to go into the store at a, at a time in the retail stores. 
And that's part of public administration because you have to come up with those policies. So you have your public administrators sitting down with the governor. You have uh, these different people sitting down discussing these types of things because you have to have a plan when you do when we're coming back from something like this. Because if you rush back and just open up everything, then everything can go awry. But you want to have an actual plan set forth. And that's why public administration is important because you want to definitely have those types of things because Without a, without a plan, without policy, you don't have anything. So you have to have a strict guideline on how you're going to do certain things. So students who are uh, interested in speaking into or having a voice or having a, a role within public administration, within um, determining what these policies are and determining um, the plans for specifically what's going on now, those are, those are graduates of a public administration program most likely, um, and those are the kind of jobs perhaps that our graduates would be able to uh, find themselves in after graduation, is that right? Oh yes, certainly, those would definitely be some jobs because they would have the background on those types of things. They would understand what, what uh, public policy is. They would understand the budgeting aspect. They would understand the different um, avenues as far as government, public governance and things of that nature. Because if you understand it, then you are a bit more able to apply it. So you, you have an upper hand on a lot of different people because you'd have that public administration background. Yeah, and that's what you have, right? You have the public administration background and you're running your own nonprofit? Mm -hmm. Yes, I yes I am. A, I have my MPA, and I do have a nonprofit myself. My wife and I. How do those two work together? Having that background and then using it in your nonprofit. Well, because when you when you talk about building policies, you need to have certain policies in place when you run your nonprofit. You have to understand what you can do as far as going out there to get different things, and you, it's all about building relationships. And when you're dealing with public administration, you're building relationships with other people as well, as well as with nonprofit. And and I'm in a relationship building pro, um, arena. I love building relationships because you can't. It's like I tell my students a lot of times. Uh, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. Because who you know gets you there, and what you know gets you over the hump. So it's good to know people. And it's also good to definitely understand what you're talking about and having that type of information and understanding to apply it. Well, we are certainly thankful that we have a relationship with you and we know you. Um, you're one of the people that we know that's gonna help get us to uh, get those students to the finish line. So thank you so much for being here and joining us and well, um, we'll be taking a quick break. Quarantine. Social distancing. Shelter in place. Flatten the curve. This is becoming our new normal, but that doesn't mean it has to impact your education. Here at Eastern Florida, these unprecedented times don't change our purpose. Your success is still our top priority. We're not alone. We're navigating this together. Although campus offices are closed, we're working remotely to meet your needs. We have online resources to help you finish the semester strong. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us by phone, email, or chat. We've got you covered. Check out our virtual student services guide during COVID-19 closures at easternflorida.edu slash go slash remote. Remember, we've got you. We've got you. We've got you. We've got you. We're in this together. 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 Go Titans. Go Titans. Go Titans. All right, welcome back. And uh, the video that just played uh, actually talks about a resource that we do have on our website, the easternflorida.edu slash go slash remote. If you go to that page, you can see all of the different services that we're offering now virtually. Um, one of the ones I love to highlight is our library. Um, the library is so important. 
And um, we do have our librarians available virtually as well. So coming up next, we have a presentation from Jessica Matheny on events management, the specialization. Uh, Jessica is also the coordinator of student life and student government advisor on the Melbourne campus. She's also the cheer coach for our new cheerleading team. And she's truly involved with student success at just about every level there is. Um, so stay tuned for this next presentation from Jessica Matheny. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Matheny. I'm one of the instructors for the events management track here at Eastern Florida State College. A little about myself, so I am originally from Missouri where I attended Linwood University. Um, I got my bachelor's in recreation administration and I got my master's in business administration. This is actually my first year teaching and I love it. I love that I get to actually learn more as we go and navigate through the course. Um, I get to dive into the textbook and learn some new things or um, a different take or something that I didn't remember from when I was actually uh, taking these same courses um, when I was in your shoes. Aside from teaching, I am also the student life coordinator for the Melbourne campus. That is such a fun job. I get to oversee the student government. I get to uh, oversee the clubs, organizations, plan and implement events on campus, and also help with student resources here on campus. So what is events management? I guess the simplest way I can put it is events management is um, researching, creating, developing, implementing, um, and obviously managing both smaller and larger events. Um, some of these events could include anything from conferences to trade shows to bachelor's degree expos, hint, hint, um, festivals, concerts, parties, meetings, anything, anything that um, involved a gathering of people. Events management also involves trying to identify the target audience. Um, formulating the event concept, planning the overall logistics, um, and conducting project management for the event as a whole. So you're seeing the whole event out from start to finish, from researching that event and um, you know checking the venues and the budget and also trying to find your vendors if that's needed, all the way through the cleanup and the uh, analysis and kind of the breakdown at the end. A few tips I have for anyone who is interested or potentially interested in pursuing a career in the events management field would be to simply volunteer for an event. That is a great way to see kind of the other side of the event rather than the attendees view. Um, everyone's been to a concert or an expo or a party, a wedding, and something of the event nature. So everyone's been to one of those. But let's go and let's try and see it from the other side. Um, the implementing, the planning, the uh, trying to find vendors, the budget, the uh, research, the creativity behind it. Um, that is a great way to kind of get the feel for it. All four campuses have a student life office and a student life coordinator. Go to one of those offices and pick the brain of the student life coordinator. Go sit down on a student government meeting. Uh, pitch an idea for a new event. Uh, go volunteer for an event at with the student recruitment. They are always having an event. Um, those are just, we have so many resources on all four campuses for you to kind of get your feel for the events management role. Um, I definitely recommend utilizing those. Please let me know if you have any questions about the events management program here at Eastern Florida State College. Thanks everyone and stay safe. Hi, Jessica. Thank you so much Hi. for that great little presentation. Hi, Tracy. How are you? I'm doing all right. I appreciate very much your little shout out to volunteering and helping in the student recruitment office. That was very nice. Um, <laughs> so I actually, um, I, I love your degree program because it's exactly what I'm doing at the college as well. So you and I actually work together a lot on events. And um, I heard that you asked your current students to tune in and watch this today. Is that correct? I did. I can kind of, I'm creeping the comments and I think I'm seeing a few of them. So. Oh, that's great. 
So what yeah. was your um, what was your hope that they would get from this particular event? Um, well, kind of, you know, obviously this was originally planned to be an in-person event. And uh, with everything that's happened, you've had a, um, your team and everyone that's working with you has had to scramble to make this a virtual event. And I think you've done an excellent job at that. Thank you. Um, yeah. And uh, so I just wanted to kind of show um, the class just like an event from a virtual aspect. Um, you know, as a student life coordinator at the Melbourne campus, uh, we are also looking into putting on more of the virtual events, not just, you know, during these times now, but also to have that option to kind of also target our online presence. Yeah, um, I feel so like I we, meet, we reach very... more people that way. Exactly, yep. yeah. And, um, you know, we're even looking into, we're in the beginning stages of it, but we're also looking into offering, um, uh, virtual clubs, as well as having a virtual meeting aspect to the already existing clubs. And we're just trying to see what we can do to make everything more accessible to everyone. Yeah, you and I do a lot of the, sim uh, the same kinds of things on campus. My job is um, on-campus events for recruitment. Your job is on-campus um, activities and events for students, for current students. Um, and so you have a lot of experience in what you're teaching. So how do you use uh, how do you use your current experience in the classroom? Um, well, I don't know if I mentioned this in my video. I've actually have only been teaching um, for this one class, so I'm very new to it, but I'm, I'm loving it. I'm having a great time. I have a really great uh, bunch of students in the class, so they're, they're going easy on me. Um, but I would say that with the experience that I've kind of had over the years, um, I have been able to kind of identify and target those um, different aspects of the whole like creating event from start to finish kind of what I need to work on uh, as far as um, really stressing uh, you know whether it be your timeline making sure that you give yourself enough time um, your budget giving yourself a little bit of wiggle room um, you know you know different pricing and everything um, and all the way down to uh, day of project management, just being able to be flexible and to have almost like a plan B in every situation. Oh yeah, that's great advice. Yeah, we've learned that with this event. Um, your mm -hmm. students were actually going to help us with our bachelor's degree expo if we had it in person. So it is great to have them join us virtually and thank you for doing that. Um, just one yeah, more question. Um, what is your favorite thing about teaching this course? Honestly, I think, um, you know, being a new new to the teaching world, I think it's also awesome. A lot of our the students in my class are actually already in, you know, that the events field. They're just trying to further their education, um, you know, for themselves. Uh, I think that it's awesome to get to see kind of their real life experiences and their point of view, um, and getting to have that really deep class discussion um, and covering all the different topics. Um, that's not only beneficial to everyone in the class, but I'm also learning myself from everyone, so. Right, well, I think it's fair to say that in this particular field, there's always room to learn something new, there's always room to grow, and, um, and it's always changing, too. I mean, we're, we're learning all kinds of new things about how to do a virtual event, just the same as you are as well. So thank you so much for being here, for sharing. Um, and uh, any other questions that come up in the chat, if you wanna just kind of keep an eye on that, see if there's any questions. I did see a few questions, but I see that Lisa was able to answer them. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Absolutely, thank you, Tracy. All right, so once again, I want to thank all of our awesome, wonderful faculty presenters who gave of their time to share about our degree programs. Um, they went above and beyond, really, to make sure that they were able to record some videos. Some of them came here into the studio and did it. Somebody, some of them did it from home. Um, it was really important for us to be able to give you some good content, but it was also really important for us to make sure that everybody was safe um, and that we were able to do it in an environment that um, allowed everybody to feel uh, comfortable with the social distancing and all of the um, all of those particular things. So. Let's talk about who should apply to a degree, a bachelor's degree at Eastern Florida. So ideal candidates for application to one of our bachelor's programs have already earned 
or are in their graduating semester to earn an associate's degree. So keep in mind, if you applied for graduation this semester, your graduation application is still has to be reviewed by the office of the registrar and approved before it's official. So if you are expecting to graduate this semester, spring 2020, but maybe your uh, graduation was delayed because of the COVID-19, you can still finish those classes in the summer term and begin your bachelor's degree in the fall. So you can apply for the bachelor's degree within that uh, final semester if it, if it ends up having to be the summer term as well. Um, if you're going to do that option, make sure you register for those classes right away because the summer term is just a few weeks away. For the bachelor's in nursing, for the BSN, applicants have to have uh, their Florida registered nursing license before taking any upper level coursework. Remember, if you don't have an AA or AS yet, you should apply first to that degree, to an AA or an AS degree. For example, if you're a graduating senior and this is your first time in college, in order to apply for one of our bachelor's degrees, you must first start with the AA or AS. Once you finish and graduate with your AA or AS, then you can move on to a bachelor's degree at EFSC. All right, so now we have our coursework. Um, the bachelor's degree, any bachelor's degree, requires a total of 120 credit hours. A total of 120 credit hours. When a student earns an associate degree, they've already earned at least 60 of those credits um, that are required for the bachelor's degree. The number of additional hours required for completion of a bachelor's at EFSC depends upon what you previously earned, the coursework that you already have, and the requirements of the program that you're going into. Your bachelor's degree advisor will be able to help you plan which courses are required for your specific degree. All right, let's talk about how to apply. If you're a current EFSC student, right now you are still taking classes at Eastern Florida, um, and you're working on your AA or AS, the first thing you have to do is apply for graduation. If you haven't already done that, go ahead and go to your My EFSC online, apply for graduation. Um, in your final semester is when you can apply for graduation. You may have already decided on which degree you wanna pursue, but if not, be sure to do your research. Once you've selected your degree program, complete the bachelor's application online through the apply button on the main website. Within the application, make sure you select, I will have earned an associate degree at EFSC prior to starting a bachelor program. Since you're already an Eastern Florida student, the $30 application fee for the bachelor's program is waived automatically. If you are a returning Eastern Florida student, you've already graduated, you're not currently taking classes, um, you're gonna wanna go ahead and um, select your degree program and complete that online bachelor's application Follow the same instructions I just uh, mentioned by clicking on the apply button. Um, you might need to create a new account to apply if you've been gone from the college for some time. If you get to the application screen and it looks totally new, it's nothing you've ever seen before, um, you wanna go ahead and create a new account, follow the uh, application and your fee will also be waived as a returning student. Transfer students, uh, students who have already earned an associate's degree or higher at another institution, in-state or out-of-state, it doesn't matter, complete the bachelor's application online through the apply button on the main website. You'll need to create a new account. Within the application, select I have already earned an associate's degree. And um, there is a $30 application fee, but that will be waived if you have checked in at the link below. Uh, you'll be able to uh, get that email that will have instructions on how to use the waiver. Um, you have to apply before 6.30 p.m. on Sunday, May 3rd. Our tuition and fees, as you can see, per credit hour and, and the comparison. All right, so next up we have some information about our financial aid. What is financial aid? Financial aid is money provided to students to help meet college need. There are three types of federal student aid, grants, loans, and work study. Grants are based on financial need and do not have to be repaid. Here at Eastern Florida State College, we offer the federal Pell Grant, federal supplemental education opportunity grant, and the Florida Student Assistant Grant. Loans are aid that is available to students or their parents at low interest rates. 
repayment is deferred as long as a student remains enrolled in at least six credits that are needed for a student's degree program. Here at Eastern Florida State College, we offer the direct federal subsidized loan, federal direct unsubsidized loan, and we also accept private loans. Work study is student employment that allows students to earn money while attending school by working part-time on campus. This funding is federally funded, need-based, awarded by Eastern Florida State College. The award is for 20 hours per week at current minimum wage. However, this may vary by department. So how do you get started? The first thing you'll need to do is file a FAFSA. That is the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. You can find this at www.fafsa.ed.gov. Once you submit this information, it does take three to five business days for it to come into the Eastern Florida State College system, and then it will be under review. At Eastern Florida State College, we also have wonderful scholarship opportunities. Scholarships are awards based on merit, special talent, financial need, or all of the above. We accept Bright Futures. We have wonderful scholarships through our foundation specific for Eastern Florida State College students, and we also accept outside scholarships. The official means of communication from the Office of Financial Aid is through your Titan email, so it is very important that you check your email regularly for important financial aid and Eastern Florida State College updates. You will also need to check your message center. If there is a red dot on the right hand side of your message center, please hover or click on that to see if there's anything needed in order to, for us to process your financial aid. Forms are available on the Office of Financial Aid webpage. There are links to the forms which were provided in the message center. If you need to send documents directly to our department, you can do so through your student drop box, which is found on your My EFSC page. You will need to upload the document and then send it to the appropriate department. We also offer book vouchers. They are available at the beginning of the semester if you have federal aid remaining after your tuition and fees are deducted. Please check our website for appropriate dates. Standard academic progress is composed of three elements. You have to have at least a 2.0 cumulative GPA, completed 67% of your coursework, and you're within the 150% of published program length. Anytime you are not meeting one of these standards, you can appeal with our department. When withdrawing from school, it is very important that you reach out to the Office of Financial Aid to see how that will affect your aid. Withdraw the withdrawal date is your last documented date of attendance, and this is determined by your instructor. Based on the calculations that we do, you may owe funds back to Eastern Florida State College. If you are a Bright Future recipient, the funds must be repaid for you to continue with your scholarship. This also will impact your student of academic progress ratio. If at any time you need to contact us, we're available to speak with you over the phone from 8 to 7, Monday through Thursday. Our phone is 321-433-7339. We are also available by email. Our email address is finaid at easternflorida.edu. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Hi, I'm Reese, and I work in the Office of Financial Aid. We know that financial aid can sometimes be complicated, but it doesn't have to be. Here's our top five tips to help you when it comes to your financial aid. Number one, check the priority deadline. To make sure you receive your financial aid package on time, you need to know the deadline to apply. If you apply for financial aid after the deadline, we cannot guarantee that your aid will be ready in time. Number two, apply early. Now that you know the priority deadline, take advantage of it and apply early. It can take up to three to five business days for EFSC to receive your FAFSA. 
And if the Department of Education selects you for verification, you may need to gather tax documents or request documentation from the IRS. Number three, check your message center. This is so important. Checking your message center is the best way to find out if you have outstanding items to turn into the financial aid office. Number four, use your student document Dropbox. Did you know that you do not have to come to campus to submit the documents? The student document Dropbox inside your My EFSC is the fastest and most secure method of submitting documents. The V4 and the V5 verification forms must be mailed or dropped off in person, but for the most part, the document Dropbox is your best friend. Number five, reach out to us. We're here to help you learn about the options available to pay for college. You can reach out to us by phone, email, or in person. For more information, head to easternflorida.edu slash go slash aid. How to apply for EFSC Foundation Scholarships. From My EFSC, select the Titan Awards icon to access the Titan Scholarships online application. The Titan Scholarships application is only open during certain times of the year. Check easternflorida.edu slash go slash scholarships for application deadlines and contact the Office of Financial Aid with any questions. Okay, so financial aid is very important. Paying for college is not um, always the easiest thing to do, but our financial aid offices and our specialists in our financial aid offices make it easy. Um, as you can see, uh, we have friendly people that are available to help right now. They're all available if you call the number during our regular business hours, eight to seven, mon Monday through Thursday. They're available by phone and they're also available by email. So they can help you fill out your FAFSA, review your FAFSA, answer questions about financial aid and scholarships. Um, so make sure you use those resources. They are available um, virtually as well. So another important resource that we have, especially during the bachelor's programs, we've talked about them in several of the previous um, sessions with the faculty, are internships. Internships are an essential part of all the bachelor degree programs. They prepare the student to put what they've learned in the classroom into practice so they're ready to go into the workforce. So let's hear about some internships from this video now. Hello, welcome to my first virtual BAS Expo. Congratulations on taking a step toward reaching your educational and career goals at Eastern Florida State College. My name is Lisa Schuler, and I am the college-wide internship representative. The Internship Office is located in the COCO Career Planning and Development Center. The Internship Office works with the four career centers located on each of the Eastern Florida State College campuses. We work together to make sure that you are prepared for your internship opportunity. I am here to share information about the opportunity for the internship that is part of specific BAS programs offered at EFSC. This information is for the internships that are coordinated through the internship office. These internships are for college credit. That means that you will earn up to three college credits for enrolling in the internship, practicum, or capstone, capstone courses and are included in the following programs. The BAS internships coordinated through the internship office are for applied health, specializing in advanced allied health, biomedical sciences, and medical imaging sciences, RN to BSN, computer information systems technology, and organizational management specializing in healthcare management. The internship practicum capstone experience that the internship office assists you in securing are set up with local businesses and agencies. The internships are organized and occur the last or second to last semester of your program here at Eastern Florida State College. 
If any of these BAS programs that have an internship are of interest to you, please visit the internship page on the EFSC website for general information. For additional information, please reach out to either your BAS advisor or to me. My contact information is Lisa Schuler, and my email address is schulerl at easternflorida.edu. That's S-C-H-U-L-E-R-L at easternflorida, spelled out, dot edu. Or you can reach me by my phone at 321-433-5261. Please include your B number in any correspondence with me. Thank you for participating in this year's virtual BAS Expo, and I look forward to working with you. Eastern Florida State College believes in providing you with every resource possible to help you be successful. These are some of the free resources available to you. Career Coach, an online tool to explore potential careers. Trio academic support for eligible first-generation college students. Academic success centers known as ASC, tutoring and supplemental instruction in many subject areas. Life Experience Acceleration Path, known as LEAP, credit for prior learning and life experiences. Campus Security, safety comes first with 24-hour security services on every campus. My EFSC, your student portal to information and applications from one sign-on location. Military and Veterans Service Center, services for active military personnel, veterans, and their families. Center for Service Learning and Civic Engagement. Students earn college credit while gaining hands-on volunteer experience. Office of Financial Aid, your source for help with applying for scholarships and traditional aid like grants, work study, and loans. EFSC Cares, a confidential counseling service for EFSC students. My GPS, your graduation plan for success provides you with an electronic audit of progress towards a specific degree. Office of Student Life, have a voice. Be a part of student government, clubs, and activities. Student Access for Improved Learning, known as SAIL, Equal access to programs and services for students with documented disabilities. Green Dot, educates and equips individuals with skills and resources they need to reduce violence. Honors Program, a learning community for academically gifted students. Career Planning and Development Center, your one-stop shop for career services from discovering your passion to prepping for an interview. For more information about these resources, visit easternflorida.edu or speak to your advisor. All right, so we just gave you a bunch of resources. Um, all of these videos are available, accessible. Um, most of them are below uh, the screen on our, on our YouTube Live going on right now. They also can be found on our website. Um, Lisa Schuler's presentation from internships, um, like I said, that's a vital part of the bachelor's degree, but you also have um, the Career Center, which she's kind of a, a, a branch off from the Career Center, which also um, some of our other faculty members had mentioned using that resource. That's an important resource, resource too, because the whole reason you're taking a bachelor's degree is so that you can get a better career, right? So why not use our career Center, which is actually a free resource to students as well. They can connect you with jobs, they can help you with um, interview skills, um, they can help with assessments to make sure that you're going into the right field, um, so they can help you with your resume writing, all of those things, so make sure that you use the resource of the Career Center and the internships uh, while you're a student here at Eastern Florida with your bachelor's degree. Um, so I just wanted to review. We're going to do Q&A with an advisor here in just a moment. I've seen a lot of great questions coming up in the chat. Um, but first I want to show you really quick what the application portal looks like. Um, so here on the uh, main screen, when you click on the green apply button, you'll come to this screen. So you'll click on create a new account if you are um, a new student to Eastern Florida, you've never been here before, or if you're a returning student and it's been um, 
I think you were a student before October of 2018. So if this screen looks new to you, you're gonna wanna click on create a new account. If you're not sure, that's okay. If you click on create a new account and you put your email address in, it'll tell you if you already have an account. Um, if you're a current student or if you are a returning student that has done this before, you're going to use your personal email. It's very important that you use your personal email, not your mom's, not your sister's, not your friend's, your personal email because that's going to be tied directly tied to your academic record. Um, and so if you are a student here, and there's a lot of families who have brothers and sisters here, mom is a student and, um, and daughter is a student, if you use the same email, it's gonna get very confusing in our record keeping um, showing that you, have, uh, that you have one email for two different people. So make sure that you do that. Once you get into the application, um, if you're a returning student, make sure you say so on your application. And then it's very important, you're gonna get to a page um, that is asking you your highest level of education. Here you wanna make sure that you select either I've already earned an associate's degree or higher and I'm applying to a bachelor's program or I will have earned an associate's degree or higher and I'm applying to a bachelor's program. If you don't select one of those two, then your, all of our bachelor degree specializations and degrees will not come up in the selection list for you to choose. So make sure that it's very important that you, um, that you click on that. And then um, again, also I'm gonna say, if you are a new student, you've never applied and you wanna get that fee waiver, you wanna make sure that you check in uh, below the screen, click on the check-in link below the screen. Um, I'll, show you, I'll show it to you again here. This link right here to sign in for the event so we know you're here. We are, after this event, we're gonna send an email to everyone who checked in at this link with the directions on how to apply that fee waiver, the $30, saving you the $30. All right, so I have seen a lot of great questions come in to, uh, to the live chat. So we're gonna go ahead and go over some of those. Um, I love, thank you so much, Lisa and Jennifer for being on here to answer questions. Um, so there's a couple of questions that I thought would be important to review. Um, if you're not able to see the questions, then um, then um, I'm gonna read them out loud for you. So one of them, uh, they've already applied and done some of the steps. They have questions about Florida residency documentation. So um, normally that would be something that you could bring into the campus. Um, everything's being done virtually now and uh, Reese had talked about the student Dropbox that's available in your My EFSC. So all of those documents can be uploaded to your My, My EFSC Dropbox and you'll be able to select the Office of Admissions to submit those forms. Um, the form, the actual residency affidavit can be found under forms in our admissions section of our page. So great. Um, uh, this is a great question about math. Uh, for the BSN, if I already have my ASN from EFSC but don't have the math requirements, do I need to do math before I can apply to or start earning my BSN? Um, and actually, Lisa said, yes, you need to complete college algebra and stats, but you can do it as part of the BSN program with us. So you can still apply because you have your nursing license, you meet the criteria to apply to the BSN. They're gonna make sure you catch up on those math classes while you're working on your BSN courses. Um, before you graduate, before you finish the program, you're gonna have to have those math classes. Um, internship opportunities for exposure within the event management degree. Um, Brianna, hi Brianna. Um, that's actually going to be a great question to talk to uh, because what's, what's an, uh, an available internship now may not be available uh, when you graduate with the, with the degree. And um, what, what will be available, uh, we may not know about it now, but it could be later on down the road. Um, I know that our internship office is always working really hard to make sure that we have uh, available internships for our programs. So that would be something that you would want to check later on. Um, another question from Vienna about pairing a hospitality degree with a business degree. Um, we don't really do minors here at Eastern Florida. When you're in a track, you're in that track. Um, and so that's the um, program that you're going to be in. You're not able to do both at the same time. All right, um, building relationships is very important in everyday life. Thank you, Maggie Stubbe. She's actually in our COCO library. Uh, like I mentioned before, our library resources are available online as well. Um, and you can just click right here where it says library services and it'll take you to that. 
um, right to their page. All right, and uh, I'm starting EFSC this summer to finish my remaining two classes for my AA. Can I apply for the bachelor's program even though I've not started classes yet or applied for graduation? All right, so Lisa Denninghoff, I would like to see if you have answered that. Our spring application is not open as far as I know. Uh, nope, that's not the right answer to that question. All right. So taking classes in the summer to finish your remaining two classes for your AA, can you apply for the bachelor's program even though you have not started? I believe you can apply to the program. You won't be accepted. You won't have met all of the requirements until after, um, after you're in that final semester. But we're so close to that semester, I don't see any reason why that wouldn't work. Um, yes, as long as you have the degree when you start a program. I think that is completed in the AA but missing a course for the prerequisites. Can you still take those as part of your degree? Yes, you can. Um, if you have already applied for admission, uh, we can't go back and, and take the $30 out if you've already submitted the application and paid it. If you've already applied but you got to the last screen um, and you said pay later or I'm going to uh, send in a payment, then yes, we can actually uh, do the $30 waiver. But unfortunately, we can't go backwards and uh, reimburse for application fees that have already been paid. I'm sorry about that. Um, internships, are they required? It looks like it was one of the courses to choose. An internship is required for a few of our specializations. For our computer information systems technology degree is optional. So make sure that you check that out um, again with your advisor. They'll be able to tell you which ones require, um, require it and which ones um, are optional. Those are, these are all great questions. Um, another really important uh, statement, I'm not sure what the question to answer, this is an answer to, but um, it's very important that you know with financial aid, thank you Jennifer for answering this, it only pays for classes that are needed for your degree completion. So if the class is needed for your degree, your financial aid should include it. So this is important, so let's say you are working on your bachelor's degree and you decide that you wanna take something different, maybe you wanna take an art class or a photography class, um, just for fun, uh, not necessarily for the college credit, but you want to add that to your, um, to your college classes. In that case, if you're under the umbrella of taking classes in the bachelor's degree, it will pay for those classes, but that art class that doesn't fall under that degree would have to be paid out of pocket. Um, you'd have to use different funds for that. So that's a great point. Thank you, Jennifer, for that. Um, oh, if my class is only available during spring, um, so how, how does that affect completion? So there may be, Lisa says there may be some 1,000 or 2,000 level courses that you could add to your last semester that would apply to your BAS. You would need to work with an advisor to determine the case. All right. If you plan to start EFSC in the summer term, oh, this is also important. If you plan to start EFSC in the, in the summer term, that goes through the previous aid year. So if you're working on your financial aid on your FAFSA application, you wanna make sure that you are selecting, and hopefully you've already done this because um, I know that the deadlines have probably passed for that, um, but you can still go ahead and do it. Make sure you select the 2019 to 2020 FAFSA aid year, and that's for summer only. For fall, you're gonna want to do the 2020 to 2021 aid year. So if you're taking summer classes um, and fall classes, then you're gonna wanna do both of those FAFSAs. So make sure you fill out those. Um, and some people say, you know, oh, I know I'm not gonna qualify for FAFSA, but I'm hoping for some scholarships. Um, and so I'm not gonna do the FAFSA. We still recommend filling out the FAFSA because in a lot of cases, in order to receive scholarship funds, you have to at least have a FAFSA on file. So it's always good to know, and, and you never know what you might qualify for. Um, let's see. Once you submit your FAFSA, it takes three to five business days for EFSC to receive it. Once we have your FAFSA, we'll be able to determine if you need any additional information on the aid and how we can offer it. Uh, let's see. Other questions? Mm -hmm. All right, so in the last semester, 
of your AA or AS degree, you can start taking BS classes. No, no, you, you can apply to the bachelor's program in your last semester, but you can't be taking classes, AA classes and B, uh, BAS classes at the same time, um, unless if you have your degree already and um, like the student who needed the math classes. Those are lower level math classes, those are uh, 2000 level classes. So in that case, you would be taking um, classes that would fall under the, uh, the lower level courses while you're, while you're taking your bachelor's classes, but you still first have to have earned an AA or AS. There will likely be um, some overlap, especially if you, if you did an AS degree, for example. Um, an AS degree has less of the uh, general education requirement classes and more of the technical classes. So when you go on from an AS to work on your BAS, you're going to need to fill in those additional general education requirements. So um, that's, a, that's another reason why it's so important to uh, meet with your advisor. They're also meeting virtually right now, um, but they can look side by side and see, okay, these are the classes that you have with your degree, with your current AA or AS degree, and then these are the ones that you need for this specific degree. So they'll be able to work with that. That's why it's, you can't really say that there's exactly 60 credits needed to get your bachelor degree because it just depends on how many credits you already have, um, how many courses you already have. So, um, so like Lisa says, you can apply to the program in the last semester and then start after you've earned that bachelor's degree. Um, so going back to review, all of you students who are currently in your last semester um, of your AA or AS degree and your, your plan is to graduate at the end of spring term, which is right around the corner, uh, make sure that you have applied for graduation. And of course, you can apply to the bachelor's program now to start after you graduate, um, but your actual degree award um, still needs to go through the process of being approved by the registrar's office, registrar's office um, before it's, it's finalized. So if something happened, um, especially right now with the COVID-19, if something happened with that final class that you were taking and you need to take it in the summer, um, then you would reapply for graduation in the summer after you've taken those courses. All right, let's see if we have any other important questions here. Uh, oh, Mr. Brown was on here, thank you. Uh, regarding the BAS, BS question. Oh, somebody asked the question. I did see this one. This is an important question. Not sure if it has been said, but is there much of a difference between a BAS, Bachelor of Applied Science, a BS, Bachelor's of Science, or a BA, Bachelor of Arts degree, in terms of marketability and employment? This is a great question. It's one that comes up all the time. Um, our advisor, Lisa, says not really. A BAS has more industry-specific courses than, a than at a university where you would take more general upper division courses. So, um, so that's a comparison there. There's more of those um, technical courses that are specific. Um, back in Thomas Highsmith's program, uh, he was talking about all of those classes. Those are specific classes to that degree. Um, with a Bachelor of Arts, there are a lot more of the general classes that you take. Um, in, co in combination to get the bachelor's. Um, and then Wayne Brown says, regarding the BAS, BS question, employers are looking for attributes, soft skills, which are really career readiness skills, um, and professionalism. The degree is a requirement, but not the, the end all. So um, whether it's a BAS or a BA, I mean, it, it really depends on the employer, what they're looking for, what their requirements are um, in the job description of what you're applying for. Um, but typically you're going to get these skills that you need within the BAS um, and also uh, as you're working on your internships and your capstones classes. Um, yep, yeah. and it's, it's doubtful that many employers drill down that far to distinguish their applicants between BAS or BS. I think uh, a lot of times it just says, it just says they are looking for a bachelor's degree. It doesn't say they're looking for a bachelor of arts degree or a Bachelor of Applied Science degree. Okay. Just checking to make sure I haven't missed any questions. And hopefully you can look, look back at this. You can read the chat questions later on as well. Um, all the contact information uh, for these different departments, for the financial aid, for the advisor, uh, you've been given all of that information. 
So hopefully you can access that from our website. Uh, Bright Futures. Does Bright Futures cover summer classes? Financial Aid says yes. Bright Futures covers summer classes. If Bright Futures has not shown up on your account, please contact the Financial Aid Office and we will review your account with you. All right. And then there's some questions about the CTC, uh, the Career Technical Certificates. Um, those are um, very specific to the industries. These are great certificates if you're looking to um, get into the job market right away, um, but they also count as college credit, so if later on down the road you want to build that into an AS degree and eventually a, a BAS degree, those courses are designed for that as well. Um, all right, if I'm working toward a BS is in computer systems, and also working, can my internship be with my current company? That is a great question. So I'm gonna read that again really quick, Vicki. Thank you for that question. Um, if I'm working towards a BS in computer systems and also working, can my internship be with my current company? Yes, as long as your internship hours and internship responsibilities are not included in your employment. So um, it's important to, uh, it's actually gonna be outside of your regular business hours, outside of your work hours. All right. So we've given you a lot of information tonight, and I hope you are on your way to pursuing a bachelor's degree here at Eastern Florida. I hope you've been able to get the information and the resources that you uh, were looking for by attending this event. Um, I really appreciate, I wanna say thank you again to everyone who has helped to make this uh, virtual event possible. Um, there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes, um, all of our uh, production crew, uh, making sure that we have the graphics, making sure that we have the studio ready, the cameras running, um, all of those things. Um, our communications department, our marketing department, making sure that we have um, you know, been able to invite you to this. And um, I just really uh, appreciate most of all our faculty presenters and our advisors, financial aid and uh, bachelor's advisors who've been here to answer the questions. Um, like I said before, we are here to help. We wanna help you be successful. Um, your success um, is our success. So we're just happy to have you here tonight. Um, that's it, thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you online or on campus as a bachelor's student and future graduate. Stay safe and well, good night.